Hi, Dr. Sean. This is Erin. Um, the first question I have for you is the study shares the normal life expectancy for pancreatic cancer patients is dismal with five-year overall survival of less than 5%. With treatment using ablative MRI-guided radiation therapy over five days, what is the new life expectancy? So, you know, the, um, so the five-year survival um, of less than 5% is for all comers. So that includes patients who have tumors that can be removed surgically. And, and there are many patients who are diagnosed with metastatic disease who can't have surgery. So that's, that's sort of for all comers. If you look at patients who have, um, if, you, if you look at patients who do not have metastatic disease, um, you know, five-year survival is still very poor. Um, you know, for, for the patient population that we look at, uh, or that we looked at in the in the um, in our paper, uh, we actually look more sort of a two two year survival um, uh, time point is, is probably more relevant. Uh, where historically that with um, that's that's sort of around twenty percent or less. Um, you know, with conventional chemotherapy and standard radiation. Um, you know, the the data that um, has come out um, recently from some other centers. Is suggesting that that increasing the dose to tumors, like we did in our in our study, uh, could potentially double that, or or even you know get get higher, um, you know even even more than double uh, to your survival. So, um, you know, to your survival of forty to fifty percent is something that um, has been published from other centers using a different sort of technique. Um, uh, we're just for future reference, and we're working on a longer follow up manuscript to follow the one that was just published, and, and our survival numbers look like they're going to be in that range. Okay, so um, just for layman's terms, to help, I guess, the common reader understand this, and, you know, when we share it with national news, that they can interpret it accordingly. Are you saying then that the survivor rate then is two years with this treatment? And But you're saying that in the down the road, you think that you'll have a paper to support to say it could be four years or more? Actually, so maybe to take a step back, I mean, is... is um is the MR Linac and the MR guided program here pretty clear to everyone, or is it helpful for me to go over that and sort of the general ins and outs of, of pancreas cancer um, that's unresectable? Is that useful or no? I think we're all sure. familiar, sure. No, but no, I think no, it's no, um, no. yeah. I was gonna say I think it's we're familiar, but it's always helpful to to kind of re uh, educate us. Okay, sure. So. Um, so the MR Linac that we have here, you know, represents a, a novel, brand new type of radiation therapy technology that really is a paradigm shift in how we fundamentally treat patients with radiation therapy. Um, the MR Linac is, uh, so we, we have the Bure Meridian Linac. Uh, we have the second clinically operational uh, MR Linac in the United States. We started treating it at MCI with this machine in April 2018. Uh, and, at, you know, and then today, you know, we're one of the, you know, sort of one of the international leaders in this field um, with patients coming from locally within South Florida. But, you know, across the country, uh, we just had a patient come here from Seattle for treatment, you know, for his pancreas cancer with five days of treatment, like was what we published uh, in, in that um, in that paper. So, um, you know, it's it's truly a, a paradigm shift in that uh, we're able to image patients during treatment which, um, you know, before has never been able to be done. So you can imagine if, if you're trying to deliver a very high dose precisely within millimeters to some tumor that's right next to the bowel that doesn't like high dose, you know, if you can't see what your, where that tumor is while, you're, while the patient's breathing, et cetera, um, you know, that could be very dangerous. Uh, we're able to, to, with this machine, overcome that by continuously being able to see what's happening inside the body as the patient breathes, the tumor moves, we're able to see the lungs fill, the heart beat, the bowel move, the stomach fill, uh, that sort of thing. Um, the the other you know very important part of this is that you know there's there's always changes in anyone's internal anatomy at any given time. You know whether you have cancer or not, your your stomach is more full than other times. Your bowel is, is always moving, uh, and so if you have a, a lot of bowel and stomach near your near these tumors, um, to account for these changes on an ongoing basis, uh, you know obviously is really critical to to making sure that treatment is safe. And so that you can also safely give higher dose to tumors. Uh, so this this technology allows us to exactly do that. So every day when patients come for treatment, we'll get a new set of uh, MRI images. We'll look at what the differences are in the anatomy. We'll look at what the doses would be if we use the original treatment plan, uh, assu you know, assuming the, the current day's anatomy. 
Many times for these patients, the doses are well in excess of what would be safe to the stomach or to the bowel because they move in and out and, and you know closer to the tumor on any given day. We you know are able to in real time adapt and and, mod, and basically replan the treatments to uh, carve out the high dose areas from the bowel uh, while still delivering ablative very high doses to the tumors. Uh, and you know and and um, you know at the end of the day, uh, what we're and that basically was. Um, sort of the, the the gist of the paper that we published was, um, you know, never before has there been uh, on an MR LINAC, in t- you know, in its entirety, uh, or, or there's never been a, a, a uniform population of patients on an MR LINAC treated to such a high dose in five days uh, before. And, and what that paper showed was that, in fact, the, the severe toxicity rate, which is grade three or higher, um, you know, we published was right around 3%, which is uh, extremely low, and in fact, lower than many you know, um, lower dose sort of pancreas radiation regimens that, that use, um, you know, sort of, uh, that don't use MRI that you, where you cannot see inside the body, that sort of thing. Um, so that, that sort of, um, that in a nutshell, the, the other exciting part and why this, so the tie that the MR LINAC, uh, and the high dose story together with pancreas cancer is that, you know, for many patients who have, um, you know, pancreas cancer, uh, their tumors are not able to be removed surgically. Ultimately, surgery is, is really the considered to be the gold standard. If you can get a tumor out surgically with negative margins, you know, that is associated with the best chance for long-term survival. Uh, but that's a minority of patients. Only about 15 to 20% of patients at initial diagnosis are able to have surgery up front. Uh, so you have you know, 30 to 50% of patients who may not have metastatic disease or tumors in other parts of the body. But at the same time, you know, there's, there's significant involvement of nearby blood vessels uh, that prohibit uh, surgery to be done. Uh, it's really this patient population that that we are focusing on, and where the data really are exciting at this at this point in time. Um, it, really, where the where the data are is that in patients who would get um, chemotherapy for locally advanced unresectable tumors, um, and, and don't have any uh, progression of their disease uh, while getting chemotherapy. So, for example, some patients may, you know, despite getting chemo, have new lung metastases that show up. Um, but if you take patients who get chemotherapy and, and don't have any new tumors in other parts of the body, uh, you know, very commonly radiation is recommended um, as part of that, of the treatment, you know, strategy. Uh, you know, historically low doses of, or sort of low and moderate doses of radiation have been used just simply because uh, the safe, you know, there wasn't a safety, uh, there wasn't safety there with, with sort of limitations of, of more conventional radiation machines uh, to deliver ablative doses. But yeah, sort of in recent times, there have been a few publications uh, suggesting that higher doses for these unresectable tumors uh, translates into improved uh, overall survival uh, and not just local tumor control. Uh, so, you know, some of these studies are, are uh, you know, showing two-year survival, again, of, you know, an excess of 40 to 50 percent, uh, which is uh, much higher than the sort of the expected two-year survival uh, of about 20 percent. Um, so our, you know, our, our paper is um, you know, technically not the first to show that high dose can be well tolerated. There are others out there, but what is unique about this is that it's, um, uh, and I should preface this by saying there's an older version of the MR guided technology, something called an MR cobalt unit. Um, this is a, a, a much less sophisticated version of what we have here. Uh, and, and basically there were, there's been a, a couple of other, there's actually been one other paper, um, that, that has shown, um, that, that similar doses can be well tolerated in our papers is unique in that it's a, it's a uniform population of patients treated on the, the most state of the art version of this machine, this, this MR Linac, um, uh, machine, which is, which allows more, uh, sort of precise treat, uh, dose symmetry and, and dose delivery in a way. Um, you know, the, the, um, uh, you know, so the, the paper that we published was, uh, you know, early outcomes from our experience, uh, delivering these very, very high doses. Uh, of, of radiation and really to put things in context, you know, this is effectively, you know, nearly twice as high of a dose to the tumor that you would ever think, you know, feasibly safe on, on any other sort of, uh, sort of machine. Um, uh, and we've, we've been able to do that very well and, and um, have very uh, encouraging uh, low rates of side effects. Uh, and also, you know, our, our local control approaching 90% at one year is, is certainly uh, much higher than you would expect with a lower dose of radiation. So, you know, I think that this is this is an encouraging paper, you know, from my perspective, you know, sort of our experiences is one that that, um, uh, you know, suggests that there could be, in fact, you know, longer term outcomes 
uh, that would be favorable with high, higher dose, um, you know, maybe better local control and overall survival. You know, we're, we're following these patients for, you know, uh, there needs to be a longer follow-up uh, to sort of look at these time points beyond one year. Uh, but, but at this point in time, things are, are very encouraging. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, you touched on a lot of the points in our other questions, so thank you so much. Um, but just to confirm, so the, the new patient survival with this technology, um, are you saying two years? Is that correct? It is. So at the end of the day, this is still palliative treatment. Okay. I mean, this is, this is not expected to cure most patients. Um, but, you know, if you can meaningfully, you know, s extend patients' quality of life and, and overall survival, uh, which is already very short, um, you know, that, that can be incredibly, you know, clinically important. Uh, you know, the, yeah. the other sort of thing I'll, I'll point out, too, is that, you know, many patients that we've treated have not needed to go back to chemotherapy um, for a long period of time. Or uh, there was actually some that we treated originally back in 2018 who we followed. And um, there's actually one patient who lives over who got referred from Moffitt uh, who lives over there on the, on the Gulf Coast. Who I just got his notes back. He's still. We treated him about two years ago. He's has never gotten a single drop of chemotherapy since then, or any other treatment, and he remains disease free. So, um, I think in our paper we included. I don't know the exact numbers at the top of my head, but I think somewhere around forty percent of patients after the radiation had not gone back to chemotherapy simply because you know their tumors had remained well controlled, and um, you know obviously that's that's great from their quality of life perspective, not needing to continue. Uh, you know getting chemo and, and having side effects from that. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, you did, so you're touching on side effects. So what are some of the serious side effects that these patients would normally experience that they don't have to with using the MR Linux? So, you know, the side effects are, it's, it's really not so much unique side effects that you may or may not have with this versus a standard machine. I think it's really the probability of, this, of, of having these and, and of these being severe. So, you know, the stomach and the intestine are really by far the most uh, commonly affected, you know, longer term if for any of those patients who do have side effects. Um, so there could be, you know, ulcerations, bleeding, um, that type of thing within the bowel structures. Um, you know, we, we saw that in, I think we reported one patient who had, <clears throat> who had that, um, you know, had, who basically had some bleeding in, in some of the bowel nearby, but at the same time, their tumor had, has started to grow, and it actually might have been re related to that as opposed to the radiation itself. Um, you know, most patients otherwise, um, you know, 97% of patients in our, in our experience did not have severe side effects. Many patients, you know, honestly have zero side effects. I just saw a patient in follow-up today who, you know, told me he never had one side effect from the radiation he got, you know, over a year ago. Um, you know, it, so that certainly is possible. Otherwise, many patients, even in their 80s or 90s, will have very minimal side effects, which can include some, you know, mild fatigue or mild nausea that's typically well controlled uh, with, with medication. And, and some patients don't even need that. I mean, some patients, the nausea, you know, resolves in a day or, uh, or a few days, and, and it's really not, not significant. So, uh, you know, we've treated, you know, many elderly patients, and they've done extremely well uh, with treatments. Um, so it's not just maybe younger patients, but even even the older patients, which is really a testament to how, how well this is tolerated. Right. And so you did address that this is a palliative um, treatment. It's not a cure. So all of these patients had interoperable pancreatic tumors, correct? Correct. Okay. And then otherwise, they would have no um, other treatment, correct? Um, what would their, like, their prognosis be without the MR Linux? You know, so if you if you take the MR Linux, you know, say that you're at a center without an MR Linux, you know, the typical scenario would be either getting chemotherapy alone or, um, you know, many centers will offer radiation. Uh, you know, again, the radiation that would be given on a standard, you know, Linux would be sort of this moderate, sort of lower to moderate radiation dose um, uh, that we know can help with, uh, to some extent, with local control, um, uh, you know, but, but really long term. The outcomes are, are quite poor with that. So to give you a sense, at one year with the standard sort of radiation approach, local control is somewhere around 80 percent. Um, at two years, that drops to about 50 percent um, with standard dosing. So our one-year local control of almost 90 percent is obviously you know exciting to us. 
Um, you know, and with our longer follow-up that we have yet to publish, but are looking at, you know, that, that excellent local control is maintained at two years. Um, and the survival that we're seeing, which again, is not published yet, um, you know, is also, um, you know, is also very, uh, very encouraging. You know, it's, it's, it's much higher than you would expect otherwise. Thank you. Um, for other uh, cancer centers, how can they move forward uh, with using what you found with the MR Linux? So can you translate essentially what this means for pancreatic cancer patients worldwide? Um, how can they move forward with prolonging, you know, their other people's lives using your methodology and technology? Uh, you know, I think it's, you know, MR Linux are not, you know, a dime a dozen. They're not very common. I think there's 15 uh, to 20 maybe in the United States today. I, I kind of, we would need to look up, up the exact numbers, but, you know, that's, that's in comparison to, you know, many thousands of standard Linux. Um, you know, so I think the, the key would be, you know, obviously, number one, we'd be going to a high volume center where, you know, there's a lot of expertise in treating a particular disease set like pancreas cancer and MCI is one site uh, or center such as that where, where we have specialists, you know, such as myself who treat pancreas cancer, uh, you know, a lot and, and have experience with SPRT, you know, the sort of, um, sort of, you know, high dose regimen uh, approach. And then, you know, also one where obviously there's an MR Linac, um, uh, you know, at, at that center. Um, ideally doing a, you know, a high volume of, of these cases, uh, because, you know, it, it's, uh, I would say just because you have, have an MR Linux does not translate automatically into great outcomes, you know, just like, you know, you take any surgeon with a scalpel, you know, they could obviously do wonders, but I mean, if you had an inexperienced one doing a complex surgery that could end up, you know, maybe not so great. Okay. Great. Thank you. I yep. think the only other question that I have is with regard to, you know, we kind of touched upon it, what this means for other, for other, like, um, for patients that don't have the, op the opportunity to go to the MRLIC, you said that they could be treated with chemo or radiation. What is their life expectancy, though, um, these patients normally? So that's, you know, so the, the, the five-year numbers you were asking about before are sort of not relevant to this patient population, um, because effectively at five years, I mean, it's, it's low single digits. You know, if you're looking at I would sort of focus on the two year survival numbers um, where you're looking at historically about uh, 20% or, you know, in that 18 to 20% range with sort of standard approaches. Um, you know, what, what now multiple studies have, have shown and, and what we're uh, involved in. So we're involved in a prospective trial looking to confirm these exciting results uh, in terms of two year survival, you know, in, in a clinical trial um, that I'm one of the national PIs on. Uh, is, you know, that two-year survival of, you know, excess of 40 to 50 plus percent, uh, which is effectively at least a doubling of, of that survival. Okay, thank you. Um, Georgie, the other questions here are, I, I believe, uh, maybe Patsy has directed them, but I don't want to overstep the web team writers here. Um, so if you'd like for me to ask them, I'm happy to do so, or would you rather do so? No, I mean, I think uh, uh, this was really helpful, Dr. Chung. Um, Adrian and John, I know you guys are listening in, so I, I, I think I would rather toss it to you all because um, I know you have specific um, pieces uh, uh, that you're drafting and writing up. So, John, do you have any additional questions? And then we can um, move to Adrian after that. I think actually, before I, I, if you have some other questions, I'm glad to answer. You know, the other sort of, um, I think, maybe important thing just to be aware of are, you know, how easy this is for patients. So one is it's completely non-invasive. I don't even give patients, you know, the patients don't even get IV contrast uh, or drink oral contrast for this. There's, so there's no sedation, there's no anesthesia. It's completely non-invasive. There's no needles whatsoever, um, you know, for this. So it, it is a very uh, straightforward process. Um, you know, otherwise standard radiation, typically uh, because you cannot see these tumors, you know, there's, um, you know, patients are typically referred to um, either a gastroenterologist or an interventional radiologist to place uh, metal fiducial clips or little metal seeds into the tumor um, through either through the skin or through an endoscopic procedure uh, so that there can be some, it's, it serves as a surrogate for the tumor um, uh, because you can't actually see it during treatment. Um, you know, none of that is needed for, for this type of treatment. So you actually end up um, getting uh, the delay to treatment is is significantly less with an MR Linac because you don't have to go through this process of now seeing another physician, going, getting prepped for the procedure, doing the procedure, 
now coming back uh, to the radiation oncologist. So, you know, that's how we've actually um, been very successful in, in, you know, many patients coming from outside of Baptist Health and outside of South Florida, outside of Florida itself, where patients will come for a consult, we'll simulate them the same exact day, uh, and they'll start their treatment a week later. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the typical workflow would be that the other patient on a standard Linac probably hasn't even had the fiducial markers placed yet. So, you know, obviously that that's great for patients because they, they may have a growing tumor in their pancreas at that time. And, you know, any any minimization of, of delays as possible, you know, obviously would be important for their, you know, to, have to, to be able to effectively treat their disease. And is it a short procedure, Dr. Chung, like, um, when they come in for the five day period? Um, how long yep. are they seeing you each day? So, you know, the treatment delivery part itself is only about, you know, 11 or 12 minutes. They're in the room longer because there's some preparation that needs to be done. Um, so, you know, most patients are in and out of the room within an hour. Without, within an hour. Uh, and they, they feel exactly the same wow. before and after. And they'll go back to work or they'll go, you know, golf or whatever. And, and actually, most patients will continue working through this or, you know, do their normal, you know, They'll do their normal activity, they'll eat whatever they normally eat. They're not radioactive afterwards. So it's actually very minimal if, you know, any significant effect on their quality of life. Um, how would you interpret this for, like, would this technology have helped um, with Justice Ginsburg? Uh, you know, I... Honestly, I don't know, you know, at some point she, she developed metastatic disease, you know, stage four disease. So at that point, you know, that's outside of the scope of, of what we would be able to do. But, um, you know, she, you know, I think she, at, at some point she had an undersectable tumor, um, I, I think, I, I think was the case. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would sort of generalize, you know, any, any, any person who has an unresectable pancreas cancer, um, you know, I, I think it's a very, uh, you know, you know, given the exciting outcomes we've seen in terms of, of treatment efficacy with ablative uh, dose, uh, and especially married with the uh, extremely low side effects, I mean, it's something that, that you know, I, I think warrants um, consideration in addition to chemotherapy, of course. Perfect. Thanks. Dr. Chung, this is John Fernandez. Hi. Just, um... So with that, I'll jump back in. Um, John and Adrian, um, I know this was very helpful, but any uh, additional questions that you may have for the pieces that you're writing up? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, my mute was, was on. Hi, Dr. Chung. This is John Fernandez, a senior writer, editor with the marketing, and I know we've done articles before on other topics, but uh, that you mentioned this study. Um, you're the uh, national PI. Is this part of the view ray study? Right. So there's the view ray. It's called the SMART trial. It's an acronym right. for okay. right. So um, there are there are a few. Sorry, there are three physicians as co-principal investigators on that trial. Uh, so um, so Percy Lee at MD Anderson, um, Prague Freak at Henry Ford, and myself. Wow. Okay. And and what what is the at what point are we in the trial time period wise? If if you. Uh, so the trial is currently open. It's occurring patients. I actually just accrued a patient here today to that study. Um, so it's it's an ongoing trial that, um, you know, we hope to finish accrual in the next maybe year or so. Okay, but these these patients you've been uh, treating with, uh, I believe, the view ray, it is the view ray, view ray uh, model, uh, Marlon. How long have you been, uh, you said about a year into, you've been following so, them? Oh, I, I see what you're saying. So, yeah, maybe to clarify. So the, the trial was not open here when we got the MR Linac okay. uh, clinically operational. So I was treating patients off of that study. When the trial opened, then patients obviously ended up going in that trial as opposed to being treated off study. Okay. So, and, and the outcomes of the patients in the study that we published uh, were all patients who were treated prior to the study opening here. Okay. Treated off trial. And that leads me to the paper you, you've mentioned. Uh, has right. that been published yet? And so that, so yeah, so that that sort of led, I think, these discussions uh, or the call today, or led up to the call today. So, our initial thirty-five patient experience uh, with this very high dose regimen for inoperable pancreas cancer patients uh, was recently just published. It's in press now in Practical Radiation Oncology. Okay. Um, so that that just came out, you know, within the last couple of weeks. And I'd love to have a copy. I'm sure Adrian would too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I, yeah, I'm glad to shoot it to you. Um, I sent a, I sent a link to Papsi. Um, actually, if if you I can tell you how to, to find it. If you just Google practical radiation oncology, and if you go to the homepage there, um, it'll show you articles in press. Uh, and if you scroll down to number I think four or five or something, you'll see you'll see the paper. So it's it's the the first word in the title is ablative. I think it's ablative MR guided radiation. I'm the first author of the paper. I see it. There it is. So it's it's actually gotten quite a bit of international attention already. Okay, I can let can I download it? Let me see. Let me see. Yeah, so it's an open access paper, uh, so you can download the PDF. Fantastic! I don't have to pay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We we paid so people can see it on, on purpose. <laughs> so, yes. Thank you very much. This is uh, sounds remarkable. I mean, I mean, you're talking from twenty percent to forty percent in terms of uh, the number of I mean, almost doubling the number of folks to two year survival, right? I mean. Yeah, you know, and actually there was some, uh, there, so there was an older, so with the older COBOL version of what we have, um, there was a, a, a retrospective paper published a couple of years ago. Actually, I think the number was in excess of 50 something percent. So, I mean, you have, um, you have that data. There was, um, uh, there was a, a data from Washington University in St. Louis that was just published with mostly treated on this older COBOL version of, of the machine that, that was um, uh, also sort of in that range. Our, our follow-up paper um, that I sort of mentioned that that is under going under um, is being finalized now will almost certainly show uh, similar numbers to that well in excess of what the what the typical survival is. Okay, and now, so now you, now you're recruiting for for the actual participation in the study. So at this point, so what, yeah. so basically, you know, the initial the initial analysis was submitted for publication about a year almost a year ago. Okay. So it took that long to kind of get through the review process. So since then, obviously, these patients have had you know longer follow up. Uh, and, and several have passed the two-year mark. Uh, so we're basically looking at the same paper population of patients with much longer follow-up now, in addition to a few others that we're going to add. So it'll probably be about a 40 to 50 patient, you know, analysis uh, with, you know, uh, follow-up, you know, approaching two years. Uh, 40 to 50, and that's including the 35 that... Including the 35 right. plus some additional, exactly. Fantastic. And uh, the trial itself looks at a five-year uh, survival uh, over a five-year period, right? The uh, no, no, so the, the trial itself is actually, uh, the primary endpoint is a toxicity endpoint. Okay. Um, it's, it's following patients for a long period of time, but it's, it's actually intended to prospectively look at toxicity. Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, I'm, I think I'm good but for now. Uh, it's remarkable stuff here. I mean, I, I want to read them. Looking forward to reading them. Sure. The article yeah, it, it's incredible. I mean, there's there's just by word of mouth, so many patients have, have seeked us out from you know across the country, and, and we did a we actually we probably worked on that piece together. There was a patient who who came from um, um, there was a patient who came actually the piece we worked on was for Jane who came from Gainesville, but we've had patients from you know Michigan, from Seattle, from Wyoming, from New York State. I mean, all over the place. Wow, that's great. That's fantastic. Adrian, if you want to. Um, I did just want to ask at least about the SMART trial. Since Henry Ford and MD Anderson are in on this as co-investigators, are they also publishing papers, or what's that status of that? So, um, so they have not yet published um, anything. So, really, the only the only centers that have published anything on this topic uh, that's even close to to this is obviously us, um, Washington University in St. Louis, which had the first MR Linac. Um, oh, I shouldn't say the first time I'm learning. They had one of the first um, cobalt versions of this, um, uh, and and that basically is it. Um, we have, you know, our paper is a, a bit different than the others. The distinguishing factor again is that our patients were all treated on uh, an MRLINAC. The other uh, Washington University paper, only a 14% of patients were treated on on an MRLINAC 86 on the older cobalt. But still, at the same time, I mean, their their outcomes obviously help further the cause and, and um, they show very limited toxicity as well. What about, um, you mentioned that there's only a handful of these machines. Are there any other in Florida, any others? So there are, um, actually Florida is unique in that there are four in the state now, um, Moffitt, us, University of Florida, Orlando, and University of Miami. Okay. Uh, but you know, our, ours, um, you know, our, our center, um, I think it you know, arguably has the most recognition for what we've done with, um, with the program and, and you know, how we've treated patients here. And what about um, this same technology? It has applications for other types of cancers? Absolutely. So the, you know, this technology can treat everything from you know, tumors in the brain to prostate cancer to breast cancer 
uh, you know, we have a very, um, you know, diverse group of tumors that we treat here, um, which include all of those, you know, and above. So, you know, so we're, we have, um, you know, multiple trials that are either opened or, you know, have received funding for, um, you know, and, and will be open soon exploring, you know, novel dose escalation for, you know, hard to treat tumors outside of other than pancreas cancer. Uh, so for example, um, you know, where we have a trial that's funded by VRA looking at immunotherapy combinations, um, with, with MR guided radiation for metastatic patients, you know, hoping to improve, 